thank you very much. And uh, apologies for the almost delay, which I guess is not a delay anymore. So, okay, so I'm going to talk about this um, uh, Julia framework. Um, that's, I guess, is sort of my COVID project. So something that we started uh, or sort of that I finally convinced myself to do uh, around 2020. And it's kind of intended to be the next generation of um, optimal control frameworks uh, for um, closed loop quantum control. So kind of the lessons that I've learned or we've learned from uh, you know, doing this thing for quite a while in Fortran. And um, so the framework has a bunch of components. Uh, so one of them is the, uh, the quantum propagators package, which has all the code for simulating quantum systems. Uh, most importantly, the, the things for piecewise constant controls that we've used for a while, like you know, Chebyshev Jeff propagators. But it also ties into the ODE solvers in the Julia ecosystem, which are uh, quite exceptional in terms of uh, you know, what is available there. Uh, and then there's the, the high level package is basically the, the quantum control uh, package itself. And then there is sub packages. I'm trying to get like a pointer because my pointer doesn't really show up. Okay, so the quantum control package is kind of the high level package. And then there are sub packages for the individual uh, um, sort of methods like Cortos method and Grape. Uh, that's kind of the setup. Um, so why Julia? So again, this is coming from um, Fortran and, and sort of combined with Python in the past. Um, and sort of one of the main motivations is to have flexibility. So you want to use a different new system, um, like something unusual maybe, uh, also new methods, um, machine learning, these types of things. So you want to be able to try things out very quickly uh, with sort of you know, not, not being tied down but what you already have by existing code. Um, the other thing, and, and this is something that you know, we want to kind of have the, the, um, like the nice things that Python gives you with working in Jupyter Notebooks, uh, but Fortran, this is kind of the main drawback of Fortran, is that you're not that flexible uh, once you sort of have a larger code base. And of course, we also want performance. Um, so we want to be able to ideally reach something similar to Fortran. And lastly, you want to have expressiveness in the sense that you want to easily be able to write down uh, the physics or the math that you have uh, sort of in a, in a nice sort of form that's not too disconnected. Um, so Fortran itself, uh, sorry, Julia itself is actually kind of a simple language. Um, so it has functions, it has structs in the same sense that uh, Fortran or, or C has structs. It's not object oriented, so it's, it's not super complicated, but it does have kind of a, a secret sauce and that's called something called multiple dispatch. And just to sort of um, go over what that means in, in just sort of two seconds. It basically just means function names have um, what is called methods attached to it. And the method is just a signature that you could call that function with. So any kind of the, the types of the arguments. And Julia basically picks the method whenever you call it. It picks the method that most narrowly matches the signature that you're calling it with. And it, it does this sort of in a compiled way. And the kicker is that it does this dynamically. So if you define new functions interactively even, it basically keeps track of where that function is called, and if you read, if, if you add a, a method uh, that is that sort of is more specific uh, to that to that particular call, then it's actually going to recompile that calling function uh, sort of for you know kind of maximum efficiency uh, sort of in a very dynamic way. Um, and this is something that you kind of have to wrap your head around for a while. Uh, it's it's um, it has some consequences for the language design that seem a little odd at first, uh, but there's a great video called the unreasonable effectiveness of multiple dispatch uh, that sort of goes into a lot of detail. So this would be something that eventually, uh, when you go into Julia, you sort of uh, learn this in a, in a sort of much deeper way. But you can see it if you, if you just uh, open Julia and you type in the name of a function. So for example, this function here is just the standard linear algebra function for any kind of uh, matrix matrix or matrix vector multiplication. If you just type in the name, it will tell you, OK, this is a function that has 31 methods. And you can look at the methods, and the, you see that you know there's methods for all kinds of special uh, matrices or special ma uh, special vectors. So we'll always sort of pick one of these, whatever is the most uh, specific one. But then, if you have in your project, you define some new data structure that's kind of matrix-like uh, or something that's vector-like, you can add a method to this, and this will be compiled and called uh, as appropriate. Okay, so what does that give you? Uh, so first of all, from a high level, you're now able to define sort of very high level interfaces. And I'm just going to go through some of the concepts of the interfaces that um, I use in, the, in this uh, uh, quantum control library. 
library. And um, well, sort of something that, that's sort of fairly fundamental, whenever you do optimal control, um, and this is something I want to sort of stress because this is often kind of overlooked or neglected, uh, basically what you do is you have a bunch of states, and it could be whatever state means, but you know, let's assume sort of standard quantum states. You have a bunch of states, and you have their time evolution. Right? That's kind of the core edit. Uh, and, and I call this here, yeah, I call this trajectory. So you have like multiple states and, and inside of for each state, you have, you have a dynamical generator, so a Hamiltonian or something like that, that tells you how the state evolves. And that, that's fundamentally what goes into your functional, right? And you have a, you know, this happens on a time grid, you have a time grid, but then everything else is kind of method dependent, right? So then you have the specific functional that you want to optimize, uh, but this already goes into like, what is, what is the optimization method? But the fundamental thing is that you have sort of multiple trajectories and, and having multiple ones means they're also, they're easily parallelized, right? So you always have like, if you do gate optimization, your, your trajectories are the different basis states and you can always do this in parallel. So this is something that is a lot of frameworks just have like one state or one gate that gets evolved, uh, but you kind of really want to have multiple of these trajectories. So that's kind of a, a key thing. And then the, the central part is that dynamical generator, uh, which is gonna be the, the time dependent Hamiltonian or the time dependent Liouvillian. And there also you want to have a general structure. So basically what we support is, is um, like this is the most general thing, right? So this, I, I wrote it as a sum, but it's basically an arbitrary dependence of, uh, you know, your, your Hamiltonian uh, arbitrary dependence on an arbitrary number of control fields, right? So you could even just have one term and have a completely arbitrary dependence of fields here. What I do find useful in practice is that um, if you have, uh, is this distinction between control amplitudes and control functions, where control functions are the things that you directly optimize in your optimization. And then the control amplitude is kind of the physical thing that couples to the, to the control operator. Uh, and that, that gives you something like you could do uh, noise, you could do kind of a hardware transfer function or a sort of more on a, on a technical, uh, on a more sort of, um, uh, yeah, like a trick, you could use like a, a shape that you want to keep constants that either gets multiplied with the, with the control or that got a sort of guides the control. So there's a lot of poly possibilities in distinguishing this amplitude from the thing that you tune in the optimal control. And, and of course, that also includes sort of the most common case where you have uh, uh, just the control functions multiplied with the control operator. Uh, but you definitely, if you're writing control software, you don't want to limit yourself to this sort of very simple case. Uh, and, you know, a lot of packages um, do. Um, and all of this is, is via some sort of relatively abstract interface. So whatever you pass as a generator could be an arbitrary object. It basically has to fulfill some properties, right? So you have to be able to get the controls. Uh, so there has to be some notion, okay, what is the control? You have to be able to say, okay, this is the stuff I want to optimize. Uh, then whatever a control is, that's the one thing. And the second thing is basically that you have to be able to evaluate it at a particular point in time or at a particular slice of the time grid. Uh, you have to say, okay, this is the time dependent Hamiltonian. Now I want to get an operator. That's basically the time independent object. Uh, and again, that has an abstract interface, but it's basically just, you have to be able to multiply it to a state. Right? So that's sort of the kind of, of abstract, um, abstract interface. Uh, but it also, so the other thing that multiple list patch allows you is to define low-level problem-specific data structures. And uh, let me just give you an example from an application. So this is something we're doing uh, in collaboration with experimentalists at the University of Michigan with uh, the group of Georg Reitel. Um, so in the experiment, they, they, it's actually quite astonishing uh, the kind of trapping they can do for uh, um, rubidium atoms in this case. So they have these, these trapping potentials uh, that are called a, a pinwheel lattice. And um, it's basically, so it's kind of a, a cylindrical symmetry. Uh, so in the z-axis, they can trap it sort of at z equal to zero. And then in the z equal to zero plane, uh, you have these, in the, in the radial direction, you have these two Laguerre-Gauss uh, uh, modes of the field that kind of create like a narrow trapping potential in the r direction. And then in the azimuthal direction, as you go around the circle, uh, you have just this cosine wave. So if you, if you look at the plane, you make a 2D plot, it looks like this pinwheel where you have these lattice sites, uh, and each of these lattice sites uh, can contain a single atom. And moreover, you can make this lattice spin dependent. Uh, so you can have two different uh, hyperfine spaces of the rubidium, and each of them can be trapped independently. And then the last thing is you can actually rotate this entire, uh, this entire um, uh, pinwheel lattice without deforming it. So you can really rotate it in a wheel, and you can rotate it independently for the two spin, uh, for the two spin parameters. So what that basically gives you in the end is, so now we're only looking at a single atom at a single one of these eight lattice sites. So you basically have like a cup 
that you can that you can trap the atom in and you can rotate it. Uh, so what you do is kind of standard interferometry. Uh, it's kind of a st standard Ramsey. So you start out in like one atom in the cup in one spin state. You apply a pulse to put it into a superposition of two spin states, and then you start accelerating uh, one one spin state clockwise and the other one counterclockwise. Uh, so you you accelerate them until you reach like a constant rotating speed. You keep it at a constant speed for a while, and then you decelerate it again so that they match up at the end again. And then you recombine it with another with another pulse. And the idea is, if the whole thing rotates, then the counterclockwise and the clockwise one you know is a little faster, the other a little slower. Uh, so you accumulate a phase, and you will see that rotation in the population difference uh, at the end. Um, uh, so, and the Hamiltonian, if you look at the Hamiltonian from a control perspective, it's slightly unusual, maybe a little bit. I mean, it depends on the frame that you're looking at. So either if you go in the lab frame, uh, you have this, so your control now is the, this phi here, which is just the rotational offset, basically, how much you rotate it. Uh, that's your control. And you see here that it's a shift of your potential instead of sort of the standard thing where you have the control parameter in front of your of your potential. So that's a little bit unusual. Uh, or if you go to a co-moving frame, where you go into the frame that moves along with the trap. Uh, oh, and then also you have, you have periodic boundary conditions here. That's another application. So if you go to the co-moving frame, though, uh, what you have, and this is maybe slightly less unusual, you have this. So now the control is this omega, which is the derivative of, of the phi. Uh, uh, and it's not that unusual, but it's, it's in momentum space. So that's, you know, I've certainly written code that wouldn't have been able to do this out of the box. Uh, so that's maybe uh, slightly uh, unusual. Um, but uh, OK, so before I go into the, the code again, let me just briefly go about the optimization. So everything in this system works perfectly if you accelerate this thing adiabatically. Um, uh, so what you get is, so we analyze this in a lot of detail. Um, so, so OK, so adiabatically works. What happens if you're non-adiabatic? So if you accelerate it too fast, well, basically what happens is you accelerate your trap and your atom just stays behind. Right? So it doesn't move because you're moving too fast. It's just sort of inertia. Uh, so what happens then after you accelerate, your atom is basically displaced. Uh, so then you start rotating at a constant speed. And then the atom is just going to start oscillating at that trap frequency. Right? And this is exactly those oscillations we see here. Uh, there's some breathing going on here. You can see, OK, the atom doesn't move. That's exactly what's going on. And then, of course, at the end, um, because it's oscillating, it's not going to line up again right? when you close the interferometer. Uh, which means you get a reduction in your contrast. Um, so now we do optimum control. You start from your guest pulse, which is sort of the adiabatic ram, or what you would think should be adiabatic, so kind of the natural ram. And uh, you do something that is kind of similar to other kind of transport problems that we've done. So the solution is not terribly surprising. It's you kick it at the beginning, and you catch it again at the end. Right? So you give it like a really strong kick at the, at the beginning, and then you kick from the other side at the end. And this way, you sort of, you know, you sort of accelerate it faster. Uh, and if you well, if you look at the dynamics, you can see here. Okay, this so you kick it, but actually the the momentum uh, in the in the lab frame is sort of you know goes smoothly exactly in the way that it, it's kind of a shortcut to adiabaticity via optimal control, uh, sort of you know the thing the thing we like to do. Uh, so you can see it behaves nicely, and more importantly, it doesn't oscillate anymore. Uh, so you're exactly in the right frame during the the rotation, uh, and the contrast gets restored to full contrast. So this is very nice. Um, okay, so let me look at the code again. So this is how what I wrote in my project when I did this. Um, so it's again, it's not uh, terribly strange if you have ever done something with spatial grids, right? So you define a, a time-dependent uh, Hamiltonian that has a uh, uh, a uh, momentum space component, and the only difference maybe that it's it can be time-dependent now. You have the um, coordinate space component, and you have the, the FFT transformation to go between them. Uh, so this you define, you define an operator that matches that, that is just the time independent version of that. It has the same structure. And then like I was giving the example before of this multiplication function. So there then you define a new method that is just the standard thing that you do with, with spatial grids is you apply your operator in coordinate space, then you do an FFT, you apply your uh, operator in, in momentum space, and then you do the back FFT, and this is how you do the application of the Hamiltonian, right? But the, the point of this is, that this is not part of the library, right? So this is just something I wrote for that particular project, uh, sort of alongside my notebook, and uh, that's that's really sort of the idea that this quantum control package is not a modeling framework. Uh, so not in the sense. So there's other packages in Julia, even like this quantum optics package, uh, which is kind of equivalent to the Qtip in Python. Uh, so this has like physics things, right? So this has like coordinate space, momentum space. It has like Fox spaces and spin spaces. 
and all of these things that are physics. And you could use all of these as operators, but they're not part of the library. So it's kind of bringing your own Hamiltonian uh, kind of idea. And, and that gives you a lot of flexibility because you don't have to bake these structures into your code. OK, so the, the other thing um, that uh, sort of the other aspect of flexibility is that you also want to uh, tie into modern techniques. And uh, I'm mentioning here automatic differentiation, and I'm going to go into that, but also like GPU computing or you know, machine learning, all of these sort of new things that are, look uh, new and exciting, but uh, are kind of difficult, especially in something like Fortran, uh, automatic differentiation is a little bit a little bit tricky to do there. Um, OK, so let me talk about this automatic differentiation. So it's an idea uh, that really was like really tried out in detail in like a series of papers, mostly coming out of Chicago. And the idea is that uh, you use your optimal, you use your numerics framework, and a lot of you are familiar with this. You just do the propagation uh, uh, sort of numerically. Uh, so it means you evaluate your optimization function, and that's all you do. And you let the computer calculate uh, the derivative uh, of the functional with respect to the control fields uh, sort of by itself. Um, and, and well, how does that work? Uh, well, it works by having these computational graphs, right? So you start out from your, the values of your control field, uh, U1, so this is like the different control fields and the different time indices. Uh, I usually call them epsilon here, they're called U. So these get multiplied with the a, with a control Hamiltonians. You can sum them up to get the full Hamiltonian. You exponentiate your Hamiltonian for that time step. You apply it to the state and you have, you know, you do your entire propagation. And at the end, you sort of sum this all up and you, and you end up with a, with a functional, which in this case they call C. Uh, and well, um, and, then, and then how you decalculate the derivative? Well, you store all of the intermediary results and you also store information at every node of this graph about the, the local derivative. Like you know analytically the derivative of the exponential, you store some gradient information in there. And then sort of you do a, a backward pass to this graph. So this is called backward mode automatic propagation. And you accumulate all of this gradient information. And by the time you get back here, you sort of in here in the storage, you have the derivative of C with respect to the U value, so the derivative that you need. Um, and that, that sort of works. But the drawback of that is exactly that you need this entire graph as you need to store all the intermediary results. So it's a huge memory overhead. Uh, it's also a CPU overhead because you, in general, you're not allowed to do things like in, plat, in place operations. Uh, so this is generally not supported. So usually when you want to be efficient, you use something like BLAST, which is you know, linear algebra. Everything sort of overwrites memory all the time. Uh, so here you always have to make copies. So it really slows things down. And uh, moreover, and I think this might be even a bigger problem, uh, you have what I call the framework problem. Uh, so, this, so this work, they did it in TensorFlow in 2017. After that, nobody liked TensorFlow anymore. So then people uh, liked uh, PyTorch. And I think now everybody likes, um, um, what's it called, JAX. And probably in five years, somebody will uh, like somebody anything else. And I see, uh, I see a lot of posters actually. You know, now we're doing it in JAX. So everybody's always rewriting things. Uh, you know, this is uh, to me seems like a problem. And moreover, uh, all these frameworks are kind of black boxes, right? So if you run into the limitations of the framework, you're basically uh, well, not much you can do unless you have a team of C++ programmers that can contribute uh, to JAX. Otherwise, you're kind of uh, well, that's the limitation of the framework. Right? So that's, that seems to me like a problem and something where uh, with Python, you really uh, doesn't, doesn't seem like a good idea to. Uh, so our answer to this is uh, what we call semi-automatic differentiation, which we uh, published a paper about a, a couple of years ago. Um, so let me sort of explain the idea there. Um, what am I doing on time? Great. Uh, so let me explain the idea there. Uh, so remember the functional. Uh, this is the function you want to optimize. So the functional kind of explicitly depends on the values of the control field at different points in time. Um, so you have, so uh, L is the index for the different controls, N is the time index. And this is going to be um, right, a final time functional that depends on the states at final time. And then you also have some uh, additional like running costs in there. And now what we want to do is we want to calculate the gradients. Right, so the gradient we want is the derivative of that functional with respect to the values of the control field, um, and um, well, this so the, you also have the running costs. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about the running costs. Those are in the paper. They're a little bit more complicated. Um, so you'll have to read the, the paper for that. Um, so so that's all in there. Uh, but uh, otherwise, um, let's just take seriously actually uh, what we have written here that there's an explicit dependence here on the on the on the states, right? 
Um, so why don't we do a chain rule there? Uh, and well, the only complication that we have to take care of is basically that the, the psi is a complex number, right? It's, it's, everything is complex in quantum mechanics. Uh, so just as an aside, how do you deal with complex derivatives? Uh, well, whenever you have a, so there's something called averting a, a derivative, which is uh, kind of useful to know about. Uh, so whenever you have a functional that where JT is real and you have a dependency on a complex parameter, uh, what you really mean is that it independently depends on the real part and the imaginary part. Right? So if you write out the chain rule, so now we're doing a derivative with respect to another uh, real parameter. So now the chain rule, just, you get, just get two terms because you have these two dependencies independently. And now what you can do, instead of treating the real part and the imaginary part as two independent variables, you can, you can treat the, the z, so the, the, the complex variable and the complex conjugate, so the z star, as sort of equivalent independent variables. And you just define these new, uh, so this is the definition of these so-called working derivatives. Uh, you sort of define the definitions uh, like that. And then the chain rule becomes uh, sort of the same thing, but now you have z and z star instead of real part and imaginary. And because it's, it's pretty easy to show that the derivative of, the, of jt with respect to uh, z star is just the derivative of jt with respect to uh, z and then start, and this is because the jt is, is real valued, so this is the only way that it, it kind of works, uh, you can immediately rewrite this to be two times the real part of this thing, and then you can basically forget about complex numbers, right? So then you only have the z here, and you can forget that it's a complex number. Uh, so that same trick applies here. Uh, so we're going to write out the derivative in the same way as a chain rule. The only thing we get is the, the two times the real part. Uh, and I guess the other thing we have to take into account is that psi is a vector uh, instead of a scalar. So you have to look at matrix calculus, but it's, it's not very difficult. It's just when you have a derivative of a scalar with respect to a, a column vector, which is what a ket is, you get a row vector. Right? And row vectors in quantum mechanics are, are bras. Uh, so why don't we just rename this as a bra, and I'm going to call it chi. So I could just give it a name, a different state, and the chi is going to be defined. So now I flip it again from bra to ket. So if we define the ket for the bra, it's the derivative of the functional with respect to the co-state. And again, that's the semantics of the working derivative. So this is the same as saying like z star. It's, it's just, it's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, well, and then the next thing I can do is I can, I can pull this derivative out. So now I have a derivative of this chi state with the, with the psi state. And that is something, if you've ever done grape, then this looks very familiar, uh, because it's exactly the gradient that grape calculates, except that in grape, uh, this chi is always the target state. So it's always the, the gradient of the overlap of the target state with the propagated state. So the only difference to grape is that now uh, we have a uh, boundary condition that this chi uh, sort of you know, gives you a new boundary condition that you have before. That's the only difference to grape. And then otherwise, you do the standard grape scheme. Uh, so you write out the, the um, time evolution of that state into time evolution operators for each time slice. So this is just the, you know, the, the time evolution operators. There's the one that you're interested in that you're doing the derivative of. So that's you pull the derivative in here. And then the only other thing that you do is you, do, you group it. So this, the, the left part here becomes the backward propagation, including this, this uh, local derivative there. And the other thing becomes the forward propagation. And the only thing we have to worry about still is how do you calculate that? And I think by that, that's fairly well known at this point. So you use this trick that you can take your state, you can pad it with zeros, uh, and you also kind of take a padded Hamiltonian where the original Hamiltonian is on the diagonal and the control Hamiltonians are on the right column. So these are just the derivatives of the full Hamiltonian with respect to the controls. And if you take that entire object and you propagate it or you exponentiate it, right, so you, you just use the same propagator that you would normally use, you get this sort of extended vector that tells you your propagation and also all the derivative with respect to all of the control fields uh, in, in one go. And the dagger is just because we're going to do this during the backward propagation. And this is fully implemented already in, in Julia in this, this uh, package here. Um, so that's how you do that. So as a scheme, uh, just sort of to write it as a diagram. So that, again, the way it works, if you, for every one of the states that are in your trajectory, so this is the index k, you take your state, you propagate it forward, uh, you store all these states, and when you reach the end, the idea is then you, okay, then you calculate this boundary condition. As uh, so you calculate the chi, you pad it with the zeros, that's where the tilde comes in, and then you do the backward propagation of this, of this padded state with that, with that enlarged Hamiltonian, and that gives you the gradients uh, sort of for all these taus, where the tau is this, this overlap uh, that we uh, introduced before. Uh, so that gives you contributions uh, to the gradient, and then you just average that over the, the, the different uh, trajectories, and you take the two real parts still from that chain rule, uh, and that gives you the full grade, right? So that's kind of the whole thing. Uh, so the only thing that changes to standard grape is you have to, normally in grape, it doesn't matter if you do the backward or the forward propagation first. 
Now you have to do the forward propagation first because you need the forward propagation to calculate this boundary condition. Um, yeah, so it's still a semi-automatic differentiation. So the so there's still a part of it that is automatic. Uh, and uh, well, the part that's automatic is you calculate this with automatic differentiation. So that's the only thing now that's evaluated inside the AD framework now. Uh, and uh, well, you can even simplify that further. So if you have something that's a functional of a gate, uh, so then the U is if it's a two qubit gate, it's just 60 numbers of a four by four matrix. Uh, or if you have something that is uh, depends on overlaps, which you know standard functionals all do, then maybe it's just four complex numbers that go into this. So it's a really simple computational graph, right? It's just like a, a small calculation of, of like a few numbers. So you can easily do that in an AD framework without running into any, any kind of uh, restrictions. So that's kind of the, the part. And I'm not going to go into Kotos method before, but when I showed that, for those of you who know Kotos method, uh, when I showed you that the definition of the backward propagation uh, of the boundary condition, it's exactly the same boundary condition that Kotos have. So this brings Kotov and, and Grape even closer, uh, but this will be, uh, I will go sort of into more detail during the tutorial, uh, so we will uh, skip this for now. Um, okay, so, so what does that give you now? Okay, so you still get the benefit of automatic differentiation that you can optimize any functional. For example, you can optimize entanglement measures, which are sort of inherently uh, non-analytical. Uh, and I will tie back to uh, what Frank already talked about yesterday, the wild chamber, so right, any two qubit gate can be decomposed in the wild chamber with these three parameters, C1, C2, C3. Um, uh, so this uh, sort of is uh, quite familiar to a lot of people, uh, or to those who are not, maybe it takes a little bit more time to explain. Um, and then there's the notion of a gate concurrence, right? So again, uh, as Frank also said yesterday, if you have a universal quantum computer, um, the thing, like usually you have your single qubit gates and you have a C0, but it doesn't have to be a C0. What you care about is the ability to create entanglement because that's kind of the if statement in a quantum computer, but you don't care which, like, what is the gate that generates the entanglement, right? So there's there's the um, there's a number called the gate concurrence, which is the maximum entanglement that you can generate uh, by applying that gate to a, to a separable states. And uh, well, it's based cal it's calculated based on these c values. Uh, and if you look at the paper, how you calculate it, well, you do this rotation, and then you take the eigenvalues, uh, and then from the eigenvalues you get the c two uh, the the c's. And then you plug them in, you do like all the different combinations of the C, uh, you take a sign, you take the maximum, this is the concurrence. Uh, so it's a way to calculate it, but it's not analytic, right? Because already here you have eigenvalues and it's not something where you can go down and write on paper, uh, okay, the derivative of the eigenvalues is this, right? It's generally not, not really uh, possible to do analytically, um, but um, now we can do it. Uh, and in, well, in 2015, we didn't know that you can do it with automatic differentiation. So there was a whole paper of how to do transform this functional into a geometric functional that is very complicated but is analytic, uh, and it took a long time. But now you can actually do this. Uh, you don't have to do the work again. You just define. You can use directly the gate concurrence, or you can define this geometric functional, and you don't have to define the derivatives anymore because these are done uh, automatically, and it works. It works very nicely. And just to sort of talk about the performance uh, aspect of this, because that was sort of one of the motivations is that there's this huge overhead in, in automatic differentiation. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details. This is a figure from the paper. Um, but basically what we're comparing here is the uh, semi-automatic differentiation uh, compared to what we call full AD, which is when you uh, do the entire propagation in your AD firm. So everything happens in AD. And you can do that either with an ODE solver or with like a special uh, not in place version of Trebuchet or something like that, uh, but we basically show in these graphs, uh, so it really uh, blows it out of the water basically uh, in terms of both the runtime and in terms of the memory usage. And in fact, if you compare it to a direct optimization that is just a simple analytic square modulus gate, it has exactly the same performance. So basically, the AD overhead is is negligible because it's completely swamped by the overhead of the, doing the propagation. Uh, so there's you can do arbitrary functionals basically at no additional cost compared to analytical functions. Um, so, so, but it's not just uh, necessarily non-analytical functions, it might also be sort of complicated functional. So let me give you a, another example from one of the applications. So this is something we're doing in collaboration with Berkeley, is this uh, nuclear spin gyroscope on NV centers. Um, so it's basically this, you know, like an NV center, you have these nuclear uh, spin sublevels. And again, it's kind of a standard um, Ramsey type uh, interferometer. Uh, with these uh, involving these three levels. So you start in the ground state, you pump it up into this excited zero state, 
Then you apply a pulse to put it into a superposition of these two sublevels. Uh, you wait for a certain period of time, uh, and you uh, then you recombine it again. And in this case, uh, what you get, depending on the wait time, uh, you get a population difference depending on this double quantum frequency. Here. That's the separation between the plus one and the minus one state that's induced by this magnetic field. Uh, and uh, while well, this, uh, if you just do it sort of the right way, it works perfectly so you get a signal depending on the wait time that's like a perfect cosine that depends on that uh, that is exactly that frequency that you want to measure here this double quantum frequency but not all the atoms in the sample or all the uh, i should say the the uh the vacancy centers see the same field strength so right? so if some of them see let's say only 90 percent of the field strength then you uh, uh you sort of get these these this noise on top of it and these are these these f1 and f2 these single quantum frequencies that get introduced here uh, so they they show up here and they show up as a sort of noise on top of the signal. And the more you know, the the more this you the more sort of deviation you have from the optimal field strength, uh, the more you see these. So this really goes up. And of course, you also lose contrast. Uh, so this sort of completely degrades your signal. Um, so you can do optimal control. And uh, well, there's some, maybe an interesting idea to think about. Something you could do now is you could say, okay, so what I want is like a perfect cosine here. So why don't I sample my my system? For different values of the of tau for the the flight time and for different values of mu, and I define as my target. So I want the spectrum to look like this blue spectrum, which is the ideal spectrum of the cosine. So you just define a functional where you say, okay, let's take the Fourier transform of my sort of multiple multiple samples of the system and compare it to the Fourier uh, uh, transform of sort of the, the plane cosine. And this now becomes the optimization function, and that's not non-analytic, but uh, because you know how an FFT look. But you know, it's a, it would take you like a few days at least to sort of implement the gradient of this manually. And now you can just try this out uh, very simply. And in fact, if you do it, it, it kind of works. Uh, so of course, it works in the ideal case. And I did it for mu equal to one and mu equal to uh, 0.8, uh, so just sort of two samples. And if you go to 0.9, you go to 0.8, you still get the perfect spectrum. If you go outside of the region that you optimized in, then of course, you still get a degradation. So then these frequencies show up again. If you go to 0.5, but even then, you still have, uh, you know, it's a, it's a much smoother, uh, nicer signal. Uh, so it really, it really works. And uh, so the last thing, uh, so the, uh, uh, just a general comment about uh, performance in Julia. So this was like one of the motivations that you want to uh, have relatively good performance. And um, so the, the baseline here is what we've done before in, in Fortran. Right? So this is just uh, as a benchmark, this is our standard workhorse for um, piecewise constant uh, closed system dynamics is the Chebyshev propagator, where you evaluate your time evolution operator into Chebyshev polynomials. And well, this is the runtime depending on like what precision you want to reach um, uh, in seconds for uh, doing that in Fortran. And in Fortran, it kind of matters which compiler you use. So if you use i Fort on an, on, Intel, uh, on an Intel CPU, then people at Intel have really optimized this at uh, sort of an assembly language. And you can actually, it's surprising, you can get like a factor of two uh, in this case. Uh, for running uh, running with iFort. Uh, well, how does Julia compare? So Julia just do it out of the box. And well, it uh, let's say it matches, it even looks a little bit better. So that's already quite impressive. Uh, but then in Julia, you also have these, um, you also have the multiple dispatch, which means um, you can just do things like GPU computing, right? So you can, all I do is I uh, say, uh, okay, let's take, um, instead of using vectors, use load a package GPU vectors. And you, you change everything, search and replace vector to GPU vector, and it will compile in the background to now send everything to the GPU, and everything runs on the GPU. I've never done GPU programming before, so it took me about 15 minutes. And you run it for a large system on a GPU, and you get a factor of, looks like two about. So there it is, right? So it's, it's basically the magic of this, this multiple dispatch approach. Uh, so this is for dense matrices. You can also do it for sparse matrices. So for sparse matrices, in Fortran, we coded this ourselves. So it's kind of like a CSR uh, kind of storage for sparse matrices. Uh, of course, I didn't optimize this because I don't uh, you know, write things in assembly language. So I don't have the abilities of the iFort uh, people. So that's why the performance is kind of the same between G Fortran and iFort. Uh, but in Julia, Julia has sparse matrices. And there, somebody did optimize it. Uh, and you can see there's a considerable factor uh, of at least two of performance uh, increase but just by using the standard built-in uh, sparse matrices. Uh, another thing you could do is, OK, this is for large Hilbert spaces. Uh, small Hilbert spaces, like dimension 10, uh, same picture. Uh, you get Julia basically out of the box, gives you exactly the same performance as Fortran with iFort. Uh, but then again, multiple dispatch. Uh, so there is a package in Julia 
uh, which I don't know what it does. It's called static arrays. It basically, uh, it's for small vectors, and it guarantees that all vectors are stack allocated. And also, the compiler knows the size of the vector. Uh, so it can take this into account in the optimization. And also, they are also you get a factor of, I don't know, 1.5, something like this. So it's faster. So this is, uh, was quite a surprise. We thought maybe Julia would be um, almost done. Julia would be sort of within a factor of two of Fortran, but it actually beats it. It matches it sort of in the out of the box case, and it beats it if you use sort of specialized uh, things. Um, okay, so let me give a brief outlook of what we want to do. Next, with the framework, I think the main thing is sort of parameterized pulses, uh, where you know you don't have sort of completely arbitrary pulse shape, but you have sort of experimental constraints that you want to vary. Uh, so this can be very useful. Uh, you get rid of the piecewise constant error, but you also have local traps and controllability issues. So the idea here is really that you uh, uh, that you go back and forth uh, very easily between uh, grape and cutoff and sort of parameterized pulses. So already now you can go back and forth between cutoff and grape. Uh, so this is just another thing to add. Uh, sort of the gradient we already have the uh, the uh, in this uh, in this package here. We already have the gradient free versions of these. Uh, we also want to do the gradient versions of this. Uh, it's the same trick that we used before with this padded matrix. I'm going to sort of skip over that. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, sort of in progress. Uh, there's also other things, semi-classical optimization, uh, specifically for these interferometric systems. Uh, they're pretty semi-classical. So you might want to sort of combine that a pre-optimization and a classical optimizer, and then sort of post-optimize with uh, quantum uh, reinforcement learning. There's somebody who contacted me who wants to Contribute reinforcement learning, and that that would be uh, you know definitely something that would be very interesting to compare, uh, or you know whatever else. Uh, it's kind of an invitation also to anybody who might find this interesting uh, to sort of get involved in the development of this thing. Uh, and of course, I didn't mention this at the beginning. This is you know this is the package that will be used in the tutorial on tomorrow tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so you will get sort of some uh, hands-on experience with this. Uh, uh, so that's that's sort of also kind of a um, preview and uh, you know um, that okay so let me conclude so we actually went through a, a whole a lot of things uh, so I talked about Julia and how about this multiple dispatch sort of gives you a lot of flexibility um, I talked about the framework how the how we have like a very general structure that really doesn't make a lot of assumptions about the structure of your Hamiltonian or anything else uh, so it's really sort of I try to sort of distill the core of what makes optimal control uh, sort of structurally uh, important uh, gave you the example of the the rotating atomic interferometer uh, that you can have project specific data structures. Uh, I talked about the semi automatic differentiation, and again, there the problem is it's a bad idea to do your entire propagation inside of an AD framework. Uh, it just it scales badly, and you know it's it, I don't recommend it. So it's that you should use this semi automatic differentiation, uh, which gives you the same power at at zero overhead. Uh, I gave you an example of where it's useful. Uh, this like nucleus and gyroscope, you can optimize the spectrum. Uh, and lastly, the performance. Uh, and this again was a surprise. So Julia actually matches or outperforms Fortran, which is quite uh, welcome news. And with this, I'm done. And hopefully, didn't go too much over time. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive overview. I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of questions. Um, so maybe you first. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk and also for being here in time. Um, I, so now that you have all these nice automatic differentiation, I wonder why you are staying with these first order methods like Krotov and Grape. Why not use higher order methods like yeah. he built it? Why I, do I, why uh, why don't you use quasi okay, so methods? I, so or first of all, when I mean Grape, so okay, so you get the Grape in. You get the gradient. You always then you use the gradient whatever way you want. So when I say grape, I always mean you feed that gradient information into usually LBFGS. So that already is the yeah. So it's always so that kind of second quasi second order is already built in. So that's an assumption that's assumed. Um, now there is a paper by Ilya about doing second order that I just haven't gotten around to really. Oh, uh, what? Yeah, that yeah. So to construct the Hessian, I don't know if it's. Uh, I mean, usually my pulses are on the order of several thousand points for these things, uh, like a you know, like a five thousand by five thousand Hessian matrix, which you have. So it's kind of big. So I'm a little still a little bit worried that I don't know, but I have to look into that at some point. There's an open issue that I have to look into it. I haven't gotten around to it. Um, otherwise, I mean, there's not really that much, right? I mean, there's some new methods that I also want to try out, but we're kind of like grape and cut off are still kind of the 
like for for you know for kind of general unconstrained optimization of arbitrary pulse shapes, it's kind of what we have. Unless uh, you know somebody wants to convince me today that there's other things. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. But but yeah, I mean we could like there's no and and the idea of this of this uh, framework is like you know it should support anything. Like you, could, it's very extensible and very sort of structured in a way that you can contribute arbitrary uh, new methods. So it, yeah, we would, we'd be happy to to try these things. Um, but practically speaking, I mean, I'm pretty happy usually with Kotov and Grape when it comes to the, these kinds of optimization, except for the that the parameterization can be nice if you want to not get general pulses, but you want to get specific pulses that are very simple. Then you might want to do parameterization, but, but otherwise, I don't know. Uh, a question. Well, actually, first, in, in Michael's defense, uh, Grape and Krotov are both rather frameworks. They support second higher order optimizers under the bonnet. And the reason Autodiff is useless in those contexts is ridiculously slow compared to analytical derivatives, which we can implement. Uh, but I have a question, uh, more pra pragmatic, of course, impressive mathematics and software engineering. Uh, of course, the other code with the same syntax that has GPU support, multiple dispatch, auto diff is MATLAB. And I very much sympathize with your statements that you need to rewrite it for the new framework every now and then. Well, stuff I had written for MATLAB in 1998 still works. So a practical question is, is, is a tiny license cost actually worth having to rewrite your framework every few years? Why not MATLAB? Um, I'm not I'm not that familiar with MATLAB. I always shied away from MATLAB both because it's commercial and I didn't necessarily have MATLAB licenses. But also, I mean, th what I've seen from MATLAB, it doesn't have great software practices. Anyway, I'm not going to talk bad things about MATLAB because I don't know MATLAB. I'm pretty sure MATLAB doesn't have anything like multiple splash. I mean, I'm again, I'm not an expert, but I'm. I'm so Julia was very much is very much designed by people who were unhappy with MATLAB. It's very MATLAB oriented. Um, so. You'll have to take their word for it. Um, now, in your case, you have 20 years of MATLAB code. You probably don't want to throw that away right? and start a new year. So you do your thing. <laughs> I'm not saying you should switch. That's probably not, not reasonable. Um, I, I, would, I think Julia is sort of superior to MATLAB in ways that we can probably argue about for like days and you know, entire communities argue about for days or weeks or you know, ad infinitum. Uh, so that's you know that's always a fun discussion to have. Uh, I think if you're starting new, definitely I would recommend you use Julia and not MATLAB for all kinds of reasons, not least of which that it's you know you wanted to like I remember the situation. Somebody wrote MATLAB code. They wanted to put it on a cluster. The cluster didn't have a license, so they couldn't run it on like you know the 50 nodes that they wanted to run it on. That's the kind of problem you're never going to have with Julia. But I also think fundamentally at the language level, as far as I know, Julia should be far superior to MATLAB. But you as a MATLAB expert might you know. There's nuances of that opinion. So that's pretty much all I can say about that. OK, maybe one final question. Uh, OK, thanks again for your talk. I, I also have some experience with Julia. And I find that you've got to be very careful when it comes to memory allocation. To yes. get this good performance, the code doesn't really look that great, uh, or it's not as simple as it could. Uh, Arguably, yes. That That is true, yes. So so one of the, I think the, Biggest thing I worry about with Julia is that it it has uh, automatic memory management, meaning uh, uh, um, garbage collection, which I'm not a fan of. Uh, it is true you kind of have to apply the lessons of Fortran, pre-allocate everything, and reuse memory as much as possible. Uh, it, it's also true that if you don't do that, it can be a little bit tricky to get the performance. Or it's like I agree with that. Um, that's maybe a drawback. There's a learning curve, right? It's not like this is like the magic language that makes everything super easy. It's probably a little bit harder to learn that Fortran for like a student. Not a lot harder. It's still pretty simple. Um, but yes, you still have to learn software engineering, right? It's not like there's no free lunch in the sense that everything is just so simple and works out of the box and you get, you know, Fortran level performance just sort of by putting like a first, uh, first semester student on it. And uh, yes, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> It's true, yes, you have to worry about, you, you should avoid allocations in your code. It's, it's uh, important for performance. And in fact, in this framework, everything is sort of in place and uh, you know, you can, it's, it's designed to do that uh, sort of based on the lessons from Fortran. It's, it's similar lessons to Fortran, right? Fortran, same thing, you wanna pre-allocate uh, for performance.